Welcome to Season 5 of the Boomer Woman's Podcast. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. The 2024 tagline for the podcast is, That was then, this is now. Design your own next chapter. When we were young, many of us fell into step with societal or parental expectations and either put our own dreams on the back burner or sometimes we didn't realize we were even allowed to have our own dreams. I am so excited about my first guest of the year as she started life as an audacious, confident, whole life child. But as she grew through her teens into womanhood, she wore the societal rules so many of us grew up with that many of us hold true to this day. Until one day, as she says, she woke up. During our conversation, she tells us how she woke up, how she connected with her grounded wildness. She explains that too, and gives us food for thought on how we do this as well. Let's get started. I've used the word rules before. It's not mine, but it refers to the bullshit rules we grew up with that family, society, so many parts of life insisted were right. You know, never disagree with an adult. Girls should get married and have a family. A woman's career was never more important than her husband's. And don't voice your own opinion if it wasn't the same as your husband's. And that's assuming we all had husbands. My guest today is younger than me, so she talks about being told to do more. Always be productive. Never disappoint anyone. So we never have to wonder why we women become people pleasers. Heather woke up to the Brules younger than some of us. She's written two books. And here's a bit of the intro to number two. These rules commanded me to quiet the boldness of my voice and dampen the fire in my belly. They made it clear that I should be ashamed of the larger body I inhabited throughout my teens and young adult years. They guided me to shove down the big emotions I felt, put a smile on my face, and keep going. They ordered me to prove my worth through productivity, achievement, likability, and a million other forms of external validation. Then I woke up. Yeah, I love that part. She continues, I was about to become a woman living in grounded wildness. Let's meet this grounded, wild woman. Heather Welpley, welcome to the Boomer Woman's Podcast. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. And I love that you that you chose that part of the book to read. It, it <laughs> brings up emotion in me every single time, and it still feels true. I, I feel it on many levels. So thank you for that. If, if I hadn't been quoting the book, I would have just addressed the listeners and said, how many of you are nodding right now? You know, because it's just, yeah, it's it's crazy. Let's start at the beginning. Tell us about the audacious eight-year-old who could look a camera in the eye while holding a large snake. (laughs) Yes, well, so Agnes is uh, referring to the very beginning of Grounded Wildness, the introduction where I describe my favorite picture of me ever taken, which was when I was eight years old. And I am standing in the middle of a nature center with this growing out perm and mullet haircut. It was like very 1988. And yet I am also holding a live snake and looking directly at the camera with a smile on my face. And just this girl, like when I see this picture of me, I know that's exactly who I was and who I am on the inside. Like I was the girl, now the woman who would do all of those things, who would look just with this kind of calm, relaxed, confident a whole being of who she was and look straight at the camera while holding this live snake and not a tiny little snake. Like this was like a three or four foot long snake. And she had nothing to prove. She was not performing anything like this was just who she was. And I think that's part of why I love this picture because she's not, she's not shoving the snake at the, the, the camera saying, look at me, look at me. She's just like, this is me. <laughs> and she knows exactly who she is. And, and I love that. So when I, I started the book out because that was me before any of those rules, which is, I've never heard that word before. And I am going to, it's going to be in my lexicon from now on. I love it. <laughs> any of those rules came to me, really started impacting me on a deep level. Um, that's who I was before. And and that's who I really am. It's just that those, those bullshit rules, those rules covered up parts of who I was for a long time. Now you talk about that picture being who you were and who you are, but there's a space in between 
Yeah. So tell us about the young woman who pushed so hard to prove herself. She ended up with shingles at age 30. Yes. Yeah. So I, starting about ninth grade, <laughs> I, uh, I had always been kind of an achiever, but in a, in a good, <laughs> healthy way until I got to high school when suddenly everything counted and I felt like I had to be at the top of my class and all of these things. And I had no idea how to set boundaries. I did way too many things, not just academically, but in my life as a whole, including fun. Like I just overdid everything and had no idea. I just said yes to everything. It was like, Carpe diem all of life, all of the time, not really thinking, oh, wait, that can lead to exhaustion and burnout. And I think I was tired for about 25 years of my life from like ages 14 or 15 until my late 30s. Um, and I'm only 43 right now. So this is a fairly, fairly recent <laughs> discovery of starting to listen to myself and set boundaries and not say yes to everything. But those behaviors and, and things that started when I was in school really continued into my career. And when that shingles happened, I, it was, I would say almost worse because not only was I putting pressure on myself, but no one was, no one was setting boundaries for me as an adult. Like everyone was giving me more work to do. And I had great colleagues and a great job and good work and an unending amount of work to do. And the, that particular time was when I was working on what is still probably the biggest project of my entire life, maybe with the exception of writing and publishing my two books. It was definitely the biggest project I worked on in all of my corporate career. It was 24 hours a day. I mean, I wasn't working 24 hours a day, but I was getting emails 24 hours a day because it was a global project. It was a big, very visible project. And I was the project manager for the entire thing. It was high stakes. And I got shingles in the middle of it. So I was totally healthy. I have no other health conditions that might lead you to believe that I would be susceptible to shingles. And yet I got shingles and I didn't even know what it was. I went into the doctor and they're like, I think this is shingles. And here's the crazy part about it. I didn't take a single day off. Like I emailed a couple of my leaders and my colleagues and I was managing two people and said, Hey, you know, I might be coming into work a little late because I need to be resting. Cause I got diagnosed with shingles. And I don't even think I did that. Like I remember being so tired once that I literally considered crawling underneath the cube, my, my desk and my cube and taking a nap. I was so tired that that's what I thought about doing but didn't think about just going home and not working for a while. I just didn't know how. I didn't know how to set boundaries. I didn't know how to say no. I didn't know how to negotiate my workload. I didn't know how to do any of those things at that point in my life. And so that led to a lot of overwork, burnout, over yesing, everything for quite some time. I should think too that if it was an international project, then we have these things called time zones. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes. So people are demanding your time at 11 at night and five in yes. the morning. And yeah, I had meetings during that time. I think one once a week I had meetings at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Um, every single week on just one day a week. But yes, there was definitely some flexing. And I think that's okay. Some flexing is okay, but not when you're working every single minute in between the flexing too. Um, so yeah, but it was really you know, I talk about these these rules and like, yes, I was making those decisions. I was an adult. I was making the decisions and culture in these rules that we are handed saying like, I can't disappoint anyone or, you know, I, I need to overwork that I, I'm not allowed to slow down. I should always be doing more. Those didn't come from inside of me. So, the, you know, the combination of kind of external messaging that became internal beliefs made it really hard to know what to do or even how to approach that situation. Yeah. I, I remember many years ago working here on the late back West coast for, a, I think it was an international company, but it was headquartered back East and they could not understand that we would work a 40 hour week because That's hilarious. Every, everybody back East usually worked 70 to 80 hours. A week. Yeah. Yes. And, and of course we're going like, what? <laughs> <laughs> So did you, did you up your hours or you're like, no, no, no. no, no. I love that. Yes. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> well, we all, we all said, yeah, we'll up our hours, but you got to up our pay. If you want us to work twice as much, you pay us twice as much. So yes. we were actually very reasonable. <laughs> I think that is very reasonable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So you've helped us see part of this, but how do women end up, now it sounds like for you it was almost a genetic innate thing, but end up a perfectionist, a people pleaser? 
Yeah. I don't, I mean, I guess I don't, I'm not a psychologist. So I want to be clear. I don't know of the genetics, kind of the, you know, environment versus genetics. There might be some personality traits, you know, but born with it. I've definitely always been a very eager, enthusiastic person. So like I said, you know, I even overdid fun. So I, I do think that there is a certain piece of my personality that's like, let's just get involved in everything and do it all. So, and there is a, the perfectionism it can, it's cultural too. Um, when I say culture, that can be family culture, school culture, national culture, uh, organizational culture. They can all layer on top of each other and make you feel like you can't make a mistake or that you have to excel at everything. You have to be successful the first time you do something. And interestingly for me, for a long time, I did not consider myself a perfectionist. I would have absolutely considered myself an overachiever. In fact, I mean, for sure, I would have labeled myself as an overachiever, but not a perfectionist. I didn't I didn't use that word to describe myself because I'm not a detail oriented perfectionist. Like I, people make mistakes. We're human. We misspell things like things happen. And that never really bothered me. And yeah, yeah, you're like shaking your head. Like, no, that is not allowed. And, and a lot of people feel that way. And that part of perfectionism never bothered me. And, you know, in my personal life, I didn't really mind trying something and being not very good at it, particularly as an adult, you know, like going to a crafting class as an adult, I had to get over some scars from seventh grade art class. But once I got over them, you know, I was like, I don't have to be good at everything. But where I really took on this perfectionism was feeling like everything I did had to be successful the first time I tried something. So like, there's no leeway. Like I can just work harder to make it a success. Like I will just work as hard as I need to, to make it a success. And I think that comes from, you know, I live in the U S like there and plenty of other cultures around the world as well. There is very much a like, do more, do more work harder that your worth is, you know, part of your worth comes from how productive you are and how busy you are and the achievements that you have. And, and that can, can be all rolled up into perfectionism. And then too, I mean, we know some like true perfectionism is often, I don't know, I don't know if covering up is quite the right word, but there can be some covering up of like, if you really feel like you're not allowed to make a mistake in anything, why is that? Like what's really going on there? And I know for me, this overachieving and perfectionism definitely overlapped with I felt behind in other parts of my life. You know, you read that one sentence in there, like that the world told me I should be ashamed of the larger body that I inhabited in my teen and young adult years. Like I was in a much larger body than I am now. And I was so ashamed of that, like shamed of my weight, my body, of myself for not feeling like I could control it and just be thin and beautiful and desirable. And it, weight shouldn't matter. And we all know sometimes it does because of these messages, these rules that we have gotten. And even though I I lost weight in my 20s, I still carried a lot of that around with me. So there was this weird kind of subconscious thing going on for me that's like, well, I know I can be successful in school and in work. Like I'm smart. I can do this. I can make anything in that arena successful. So if this other part of my life that relates to how I feel about my body and dating. And I, I am single. I'm not a mother, you know, all of these things that again, are rules that women are handed of like part of your purpose in life. Your biggest purpose in life is to be a mom. Um, and then a wife maybe secondarily. And I still feel that even though I'm a different generation, I still feel those messages, even though no one told me them directly, I still feel them. And I wasn't like fulfilling that. And so it was like, well, let's be, let's be an overdoer and a perfectionist in this other area of my life, because I know I can be successful there. This part of my life with dating and body and motherhood and all these things, I feel like I can't control that. This, the achieving, I can control that. Um, And so I think there, for me, there's a lot of, there's a lot of jumbling that happens there. And I think it's different for every person, but that's, that's a bit of my story. Yeah. And and I'll just briefly refer to certainly the role model I grew up with, who was Barbie, uh, still around when you were a girl. Uh, and I was in my early 40s before I really realized that unless you take a hacksaw to my body, I am never going to look like Barbie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and these things called bones in the way. Right, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I grew up in the time period, kind of in that, you know, my teen years were in like the early to mid nineties where that waif look was very in. So not curvy like Barbie, more like you, you are just straight up and down, clothes are hanging off you, ribs are sticking out. And 
I was never even that was never going to be me. But yet that was what I viewed as the standard of beauty was like the thinner, the better. That was what beauty was. And I so I I didn't feel beautiful or desirable for a really, a really, really long time because because that's what I saw. No one told me that. No one there. I had no one lording over me telling me I had to lose weight or telling me that my body was ugly. But yet I got the message every single day that those things were true, that my body was ugly and I needed to lose weight based on everything I saw around me. Yeah. Well, just to prove that nothing really does change, uh, we we had Twiggy. Yes, I know Twiggy. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. So there you go. <laughs> just the name alone, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah. No, exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, in my 40s, I realized that very few women are ever meant to look like a 13 year old boy. You know? No, no. And we all have different bodies. I mean, and, and they really are all beautiful in their own way. I mean, it, and it's taken me a long time to to recognize that. I mean, really just in the last couple of years. And I still do think about my body. It annoys me that I think about it. It annoys me that I think about what I eat or that, you know, I go back and forth on, oh, should I lose a little weight? Would that be healthier? Da, da, da. But what's different now is for a long time, I really felt like I needed to prove myself in other ways because of body and all of these things. And I don't feel that way anymore. And so it's not like it's completely gone, but I don't feel like I need to overachieve in order to make up for body or being single or all of those things. Or when I go out on a date, I don't feel like I need to prove to this person that I am fun and, you know, adventurous and smart and all these things to like somehow make up for the areas that I perceived for so long that I lacked because one, I don't lack in them anyway. And two, it, it, we don't need to, we're just who we are. <laughs> so that, that seems to have been a one-way door and I'm very happy. Um, very happy that that was a one-way door. Well, I'll just interject for a moment that yeah. I interviewed a, a sex therapist uh, maybe last year sometime. And she made it quite clear that her partner loved the, the thing he loved most. Well, I shouldn't say the thing he loved most about it, but he did adore her jiggly bits. Yes. So there you go. <laughs> Everyone has their preferences. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. <laughs> I but love that. Just going back to your career for a moment, did, did you ever have like a promotion or a job sort of held over your head? Like if you don't perform to these standards or, uh, you know, like, or if you manage to get this, you know, project off the ground, you know, you'll get the next bit or something. No, interestingly, I, I worked for two different companies. So now, now anyone who's listening, now I run my own business. I'm a speaker yeah. and an author. So that is what I do now. Um, I worked in two large companies for about 10 years before doing that. And one of them in particular, the one that I was at for eight of those 10 or 11 years, promotions it weren't a huge thing. It was not a, it was, even though it was a massive company, it wasn't a overly hierarchical company, which I'm very grateful for. So no, nothing was ever lord over my, and, and to be fair, I was overachieving everything. So there wasn't, it's not like I never had improvement areas. Absolutely. I did. I always had things like we all do that I could develop and work on skills, behaviors, that sort of thing. But from a, fulfilling expectation standpoint, I was fulfilling and going above and beyond pretty much all of the time. Um, so there wouldn't have really been anything. It wasn't the culture to do that. And I don't think there would have been anything to, to Lord over me anyway. <laughs> There's, I could not have done any more than what I was doing in the majority of the jobs that I was in. So, so yeah, no, I don't, I don't feel like there was any punishment. I had a lot of support and that's the really interesting thing. I, I had great managers. Um, I just held two book launch, a few different book launch parties in both Colorado and Minnesota. I live in Colorado, but I'm from Minnesota. I had managers that managed me 10, 12 years ago come to my book launch parties. Like they're still in my life. They're still supporting me now. So I had great managers and I still felt all this. I still felt all of, of these things of like, I need to be doing more. I don't know how to set boundaries. I don't know how to say no. Um, and part of that's cultural. Like I said before, like work was always coming in. Some companies are better at work-life balance from a cultural standpoint than others. And and then I had my own internal stuff too. So a combination of of an overworking culture and an overworking human is a bad combination <laughs> when it comes to health and well-being. <laughs> at, at the risk of sounding 
sounding like I'm criticizing. Quite honestly, you sound like the kind of employee that the rest of us would hate because you're setting this amazing example. Now we have to keep up. <laughs> it's possible. Honestly, the particularly... I, I worked with a lot of people just like me. So oh, okay. I don't, um, I don't feel like I, I actually looking back, I don't think I worked more than most people. We were all overworking. So it was a very, which again, contributes, I think to more overwork when everyone around you, that's just the standard. Like if you had been in the East coast office and you entered in that and you're like, oh, well, I guess this is just what I, I do. It was easier to say no from a thousand, a thousand miles away. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Yeah. yeah, my son actually works back east um, on the uh, eastern seaboard, and uh, he was out here in the summer. And it's like he's down in my office here at like five thirty six in the morning, and I I get up early. And I'm like, what are you doing? You're on holiday. And he goes, well, yeah, but it's nine o'clock there, so I'm I'm on holiday. I'm only working eight hour days. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, I will say I always took vacation. <laughs> that was, the, that was the one place I was really good. I was like, my vacation time is my time. And I love to travel. I still love to travel. That's actually one of the things that's harder as an entrepreneur is to figure out how to full on take vacation yeah. when you don't have a backup in place. Exactly. So yeah. yeah, but that's, yes, that's a, that's a sign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think uh, if I remember the, your uh, intro, it says, then I woke up. What happened? two things happened. It was, it was a multi-year process, which is why there are two different books. So the first, uh, the first wake up was around this overachieving rule. So I had started my business and I was excited about what I was doing, but I was driving myself into the ground. Like all of this pressure, I felt like I had to make my business successful. Every program I launched, everything I was trying that was new needed to be successful right away. I need to match my corporate salary. I mean, just all of these really unrealistic expectations. Um, and because of that, I was like driving myself into the ground and not just from a hour standpoint, it was really like mentally and emotionally. Like I would wake up thinking about work and go to sleep thinking about work. And, and I realized that in the moment I had a little bit of a mini breakdown and I was like, why am I doing this? Like, where does this come from? And for the first time, instead of just saying like, oh, cause in my corporate career in particular, it was always like, oh, I just need to make it through this next thing and then I'll get a break. Or I just like, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And sometimes that light came, but oftentimes it was a lot more faint than what it had seemed like, or the break was shorter before the next big thing came. And I never really stopped to examine where all of this was coming from, why I was showing up this way in a, you know, open, compassionate way. And when I did, then I started to see what I call these rules, the rules that we are handed. Um, and this, the, the overachieving ones tend to be pretty gender neutral. They, they give, they're given to anyone. And I was like, wait, I can make a different decision. Like, yes, I've been handed these rules by our culture that say, be productive all the time, overdo everything. You have to be successful the first time you try something. And I can make a different choice, which definitely did not happen overnight, but it was a very conscious breaking of those rules. So that was stage one, was really letting go of the what I connected my worth to achievement and productivity and success. What I didn't know at the time, so that's when I wrote my first book, which is called An Overachiever's Guide to Breaking the Rules, How to Let Go of Perfect and Live Your Truth. What I didn't know was that that was really just the first set of rules. Once I started to recognize these rules, I started to see them in other parts of my life. And for me, that really showed up in, in two specific areas, although I think there's kind of some generalized areas too. So one was um, around my body, which I talked about before and, you know, feeling like because I grew up in this larger body and then I was single, feeling like I was less than and, and I was really broken in this one part of my life. I did not feel broken in the other parts of my life. In fact, I was quite confident in many parts of my life, but this one whole section related to body and dating and stuff, I felt, I felt broken. And I realized through some therapy and some things going on that I had this realization one day I was reading Rising Strong by Brene Brown. And she talks about how the stories that we're both given and we create in our brains, like we, we create these conclusions of them that are often not true. They're not true. And I, something was clicking into place as I was reading this part of Rising Strong. And I was also examining already. And I was like, wait, I'm going to rewrite I'm going to rewrite the story that I believed when I was 13. 
And the story that the original story I believed was like, boys aren't interested in me um, because of my weight. Essentially, it's it's my fault that I'm not able to get thin. So I'm the one who's broken. And I rewrote it, which started out with actually a similar place. Cause I do think when I was 13, when I think about all these rules are handed, I do think boys weren't interested in me because I was of my weight when I was in middle school and high school, you know, a long time ago. But then I rewrote it from there saying, you know, our culture hands us rules to all genders that part of a woman's worth is in her, her body and her weight and her likability and desirability. And then I realized, wait, that I'm not broken. It's the rules and the system that are broken, not me. And that realization, I mean, I was writing it down in my journal, this kind of, this kind of flow of, of rewriting the story. And it was like a weight lifted off of me immediately. It was just like, wait, 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 wait. I'm not broken. The system is broken. And not only did that was the one way door I was talking about that, like once immediately when I had that realization, it was like, oh, wait, no, I don't have to be ashamed of this because that, that was never mine to carry this weight, this shame, this brokenness was never mine to carry. That was always a problem that was outside of me. I now have responsibility and accountability to, to do what I'm going to do after this realization and to let go of that and, and my own responsibility for my actions and all of that. So it's not about shoving everything in the system and not taking on any accountability, but I didn't need to take it all on either, which is what I had been doing for a very, very long time. And once I realized that, I started to see these rules in other parts of my life and other people's lives. And like I said, the overachieving one's pretty gender neutral, but then I really veered in this direction of like, what are the rules that women in particular are handed about what it means to be a good woman, a good mom, a good girl, to be likable, to be desirable, to, to you know, to be bold, but to not use our voices too much and to not be too direct. And, and I thought then of like this feedback that I'd gotten in my corporate career that I could be too direct. And the combination of that feedback with my overachieving perfectionist style, I took it on way too much and started to hold back. I was never quiet, but I I held I held back. I felt constricted for a long time. And um yeah, so those were my my two big areas of like when I really started to wake up was seeing all of these different rules and recognizing my worth separate from them and also realizing I can make a different decision that I don't have to believe even if it was subconscious for a long time, that my worth is connected to any of those things, that I get to create my own rules and know that my worth stands completely separate from any of any of those things, um, any of those rules that I was handed. I find it interesting too that you separate the genders there because I don't know if you've ever seen that meme where, you know, like a, a man is called assertive, a woman's called bossy. Yes. You know, a man's a good leader, a woman's a pain in the ass. Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes. And I want to be clear, men, I mean, we're talking cisgender here, but like men are absolutely handed rules as well. And, you know, I think for example, a lot of men get handed, like I can't be vulnerable or I can't show some of those emotions or I think your generation even more so than mine. Like I have to be the provider. I have to be responsible. I have to be the breadwinner. And, you know, the, so it's not like men are, are not handed rules as well. Interesting. I read a book once that was saying, you know, we're all handed rules that affect us psychologically. However, the rules that men are handed lead to greater power. And I thought that was a really, so none of us are particularly like our health and well-being and psychology isn't positively impacted by these rules, but the rules that men are handed lead to greater power versus, versus women. And I thought that was a really interesting distinction. And I think just because I am a woman and I seem to embody a lot of these classic, um, classic things that women have experienced and, and beliefs, it makes me really passionate to want to unravel them and, and yeah. And that's my second book, which is called Grounded Wildness came out of that, that realization of like, oh, it's not just about overachieving. It's these rules as a whole. And like, I was never broken. The system was broken. And the feeling that came out on the other side of that was what I call grounded wildness. So when I'm so grounded in myself in my worth and my dignity and my authenticity and who I am, that that leads to a freedom and wildness but in a tethered way, in a positively tethered, grounded way, not a chaotic wildness, but a grounded wildness. And that's where the title of the book came from. So you aren't overachieving that fun anymore, you're saying. 
day. I can I do a little bit of both. Say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I still remind myself and actually I'll say I'm coming out of the book launch season and I look back and I don't regret anything that I said yes to. I felt like I had really good boundaries and I was still exhausted. Like I, it was Thanksgiving here in the U S recently. And I spent four days doing not much. I went hiking, but I also watched like five Hallmark Christmas movies during that time period and slept nine hours a night. And it was exactly, exactly what I needed. So, um, yeah, even though I look back and I'm like, I would do it it all the same again, I was still tired and needed some recovery at the end of, of doing that. So yeah. And there are times, there are times when I still catch myself and I'm like, okay, let's, let's reset some boundaries here, but it's, typically way before real burnout uh, happens or chaos in in my mind and stress and all of those things. So you've you've made it sound as though it was not a difficult transition for you. Oh, that's inaccurate. (laughs) Oh, okay. So, So how did you connect with your grounded wildness and how do we do that? Yeah. Um, so I think once I had the realization, it wasn't that hard. So that part And that's, I think what I've verbalized here is, you know, that, that part and actually the overachieving one, it took some work, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't like horrifying. It wasn't, you know, soul opening vulnerability. It it felt, I didn't need a therapist to go through that, that realization and that wake up, but I did with the second one. And I'll tell you, I had a situation, what, what kind of brought on this realization was a really hard situation, which was. I was uh, dating someone pretty casually and he told me that he didn't want to date. He didn't want to have like a a real relationship. And I was very disappointed by that. I was also enjoying what we were doing and, and it was all, you know, so I told him it was okay for now, which was like partly true, partly not true, but I was disappointed. I was really disappointed and, you know, rightfully so. And that, that was, I wish things could have been different, but the disappointment wasn't what made this realization happen or the hard stuff. What happened was not that long after he told me he didn't want to date anyone, he did start dating someone. And and I appreciated that he told me. And also it broke me open and broke me down in a way. I mean, it was just tears. It was like salt being poured into open wounds. It was like 25 years of emotions were finally coming to the surface. And I was dealing with them in a way that I I knew, I knew that this was bigger than just the situation at hand. Cause I was like, okay, I am disappointed here, but what is going on? Like this is, this is way bigger than this one situation. And that's what caused me to stop and really, really do a deep dive with compassion, um, not with self-blame, not with self-criticism, not by saying, what do I need to fix about myself or what is wrong with me, but just saying, what's really going on here? And how do I rewrite rewrite my stories? Because I don't want to keep living like this the whole rest of my life. I don't want to keep feeling like this the whole rest of my life. So how do I unravel unravel what's going on? So once I had the realization it wasn't, I mean, I do reminders, I do all of that kind of stuff, but the, after the realization, it was, was freeing. It was good. It wasn't, wasn't that hard. The few months before that realization were really hard. Um, they were really, really hard. I mean, there's a section of the book I called the break and it's breakdown, break open and breakthrough. And that breakdown was hard. And I think we all have them in different parts of our life, you know, whether that is catching yourself ill because of burnout or a relationship disintegrates, whether that's with a partner or a parent or a child or a good friend, or, you know, you just have your own wake up call or whatever. And we think we've all had several of those and that cause us to, to break down. And for me, you know, we can break down a lot without breaking open and breaking through. And the difference is that compassionate, open questioning without self blame, but just with curiosity and saying, what's really going on here? And, and how do I, how do I really make a change? And yeah, so that it wasn't, it definitely was not easy. I can sit here on the other side of it and speak, speak about it with, with joy (laughs) and gratitude. Um, But in the moment there was um, a lot of tears and dancing and journaling and talking with friends and a therapist and all the things. (laughs) Now, did you receive pushback? Like, cause you were really making big changes and sometimes 
with some people when you don't show up how they expect you, how they've always seen you to show up, they, they push back. You're absolutely right. And I would love to hear if you have any stories on that too, of your own, own rules <laughs> and, and changing them over the course of your lifetime. So interestingly, I made some big external. So in, in, during this time period, I left my corporate job. I started a business. I moved from Minnesota to Colorado. Like I sold my condo. I moved into a rental. Then I bought another house. Like it's, there's been a lot of transition in my life in general. Yeah. Really big, really big life changes that have all been great and, uh, and very much made on purpose. And so I know the answer for me is no. Having said that, had I still been in my corporate career? Maybe. I don't know. Oftentimes I found with, because I still coach people, I still talk to a lot of women. I do speaking engagements inside corporations. Oftentimes when I talk to people about boundaries, they find that 90% of the time people don't care nearly as much as we think they're going to. Um, you know, we make this really big thing in our heads about what, what that conversation is going to be like. And then when you have it, it's like, oh, that wasn't that big of a deal. Or maybe they don't like it, but they're okay with it. Or it, you find that it's worth the pushback because you have more time and more space or whatever it is. Um, interestingly, I got a lot of comments, uh, but you just be based on social media, but by people who really knew me that suddenly were commenting like, gosh, you just, you look so free. You look so free. And this was around the time that I was moving to Colorado. So everyone just kind of chalked it up to me moving to Colorado and being out in the mountains in the open space. And I think that was a part of it. I love living here. I love being outside. I hike all the time. And even at the time I was like, mm, no, there's something more going on here. Like this is an internal shift more than anything. So I didn't get that much, that much pushback, but I also had a lot of transition in my life happening. And so with the people that I, the new people that I was meeting, I was just showing up of like, this is me now. And, and it isn't a totally different person. I mean, I still have a lot, I, my family, my friends from before I went through this huge transition, I don't think any of them would say I'm a totally different person now. I'm just, I'm more operating at like 98% of myself instead of like 80% of myself. You know, my, my fullness maybe is a better way of putting that. So I, I overthink less. I overanalyze less. I say more what's on my mind and I let it out and I go for what I really want in my career. And I, yeah, just show up with a, a more full, a more full energy, I think. But yeah, I don't think anyone would say that I'm like that different. It's more internal shifts. That's when they God. start saying, hey, we really like the new you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I do think there's you know, people, you're right. People can get pushed back. I've definitely heard that from people, you know, especially if they've like set boundaries with family members or things like if they've always been the person in their family that just like everyone goes to and suddenly they're like, wait a second. No, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be the doormat for this family anymore. Yeah, um, you know, they, there, there can be some guilt tripping and some, um, you know, frustration and all of that. So for me, like whenever I think, or whenever there's fear for me in general, whether it's, yeah, just any kind of fear, I really think of like, well, what's worth it? Like, what is worth it? What's bigger than that fear? Like, I was nervous about Grounded Wild, really nervous about people reading Grounded Wildness. Like, writing it was easy. Publishing it and knowing people were going to read it has been definitely a challenge. And to the point where it actually made me question like, oh, maybe I I have clearly have some more layers of Grounded Wildness to get through here because I didn't, I, I knew it wouldn't be easy, but it was harder than what I had expected. So, so yeah, I think what, but, but I was very clear on, what was bigger than that for me, which part of it was just speaking my truth. I think there's so much freedom, so much freedom that comes from speaking what's really true for ourselves. And then there was also, you know, the chance that it could impact someone else. And that felt bigger um, than any of my, my own fear, the combination of freedom for me and the potential impactor for others. And, and I've seen that already. So, you know, it's not like, it's not like this is a New York times bestseller by any stretch of the imagination. And I still, and I get feedback from people of all ages. So I've had people in their twenties up through in their eighties, uh, read this book. And my mom, my, uh, my mom is distributing it to all of her friends. <laughs> um, and they are all, they're all reading it to the point where I think I'm going to go visit, um, go visit her, uh, in January, my family in January. And I think we're going to do a book club with all of her, like all of her friends that she knows because they're so curious and want to want to talk about the book. And so um, the concepts definitely apply to to all ages. So yeah. Okay. Well, so, so let's go there for a moment. Mm -hmm. Boundaries, saying no 
be yeah. true to yourself. Mm -hmm. They can be hard asks. Do you have some first steps for a, for a listener who's going like, yeah, we, uh, yeah, duh. <laughs> yeah, I would say start small. So, you know, start with um, maybe even something that, you know, isn't that big of a deal, but you typically would have said yes to, but you know, it's not that big of a deal just to start you know, getting, getting the muscle going, or even before that, the thing I did started doing more towards the end of my corporate career, when I, I found myself in some, where I really didn't have the capacity, I'd take, I'd said yes to things that I really shouldn't have said yes to, because it was just too much. I started to pause and first just give myself some space. So like to realize you don't have to say yes to something right away. You can say, I'm going to think about that and get back to you. And I don't care whether that's about work or whether that's about an invite to a happy hour or to play pickleball, like it does not matter. You can say, I need a day. I'll get back to you later. I need to think about that or, or whatever you want to say and, um, and give yourself some space. And then I would start asking myself, what am I saying no to if I say yes to this? And oftentimes those choices weren't stacked up right next to each other. It wasn't like, oh, if I say yes to this project at work, I'm saying no to hanging out with my friends on a Saturday afternoon, or like it wasn't, you know, the choice between two projects, but yet there is always a trade-off. And sometimes that's in time and energy and more tangible things. And sometimes it's an emotional trade-off. Like, you know, do I say yes to this party invite that I don't really want to go to, or where I know I'm not going to be that supported, or it's not people that I really enjoy? Like, am I going to resent showing up at this party and I'm not going to enjoy myself? Is that worth it? Is that trade-off worth it? You get to decide. You get to decide whether that's worth it. I'm not going to tell anyone what boundaries they should set. And so I would say start, you know, start small. And then but with those bigger things, especially if there are places where you feel like something isn't okay with you. And I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter what that is, but there's something in a relationship and and that's not okay with you. I've had some of those hard conversations in the last few years. And there's a certain moment where it's just like, take a deep breath. Think about it ahead of time. Think about what you what you want to share, but then you just take a deep breath and do it with the fear there, with the terror there, with the heart thumping, with all of those things, and and you you say the thing that needs to be said, and it's not easy, and there's also so much freedom that comes on the other side of that for you. Sometimes for the other people involved, I, I think relationships, some of them might crumble because you set boundaries, but most of them will be better. Um, most of them will be better because there's going to be greater respect. People know where you stand and they know that when you do say yes, it's a full yes that you want. You want to be there. You want to, you want to be all in. So yeah, start small, uh, start asking yourself trade-offs, buy yourself some time <laughs> um, before you say yes or, or, or say no um, and make a more conscious decision, especially if yes is your automatic. And then at some point, just take a deep breath and say no, or say the thing that needs to be said or set the boundary or whatever it is. I, I heard a phrase one time or a piece of advice one time that is no is a full sentence. Yes. I'm still learning that too. Like I, I, I have a podcast also called grounded wildness and I was interviewing someone. Um, the episode's going to come out next week. And she was saying that um, she was renegotiating her workload and she literally just told her employer, I am not available to work on nights and weekends. And I was like, that's all you said. Like I am, I am not available. And she's like, yeah. I was like, that's amazing. I have never, I've never heard someone just say that. So particularly a woman say that so clearly, like, no, I am just not available. I was like, wow, what, what, like, what are we all not available for? And whether that's with, you know, work or time or energy or emotions or people or whatever, and how would our life change if we're like, I'm just simply not available for that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and you just say no. Yeah. It hit home for me when I was working. Um, I worked briefly in staffing in a union environment. So when they phoned in sick, even though I knew it was total BS, I just said, okay. Yeah. I will. She said, I will not. He, she said, I will not be there. I am yeah. sick. Yeah. And, you know, whereas usually we need to justify things. Yes. I, you know, I've got a really sore throat and I'm all congested and I'm plugging my nose. So you, really, <laughs> you really think I'm sick. But yeah, you don't have to explain. It's yes, no, whatever it is. It's, yeah. it's true. It's true. I'm curious. Can I ask you a question? Is that okay? Sure. Uh, I'm curious when you think about generationally, you know, we're one generation apart from each other. What rules do you see differently in your generation than in my generation for women in particular? 
Oh, okay, I'm just going to compare you to my daughters, I guess. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think, you know, with some exception, I mean, <laughs> I just talked to a fellow whose mother died a couple of years ago at age 98, and she was like just a rule breaker. She she yeah. got so far ahead. <laughs> she was getting master's degrees before men even knew there was master's degrees. So there's always those outliers. Yes. But But generally, I think just being okay being who you are and making your life choices. Mm. You know, if you want to be a homemaker, great. If you want to be a rocket scientist, go for it. Yeah. Uh, those sorts of things. If you have four children and you can afford to put them all in daycare, that is your choice. Mm -hmm. You know, it, whereas with me, it was, you know, like, well, for, I don't think I could have afforded to put three children yeah. in daycare. <laughs> <I feel laughs> but, <lot. laughs> yeah. but uh, you know, just that pressure to, oh, you've had children now, you should, you know. And even going back another generation, because I had a career in elder care, I remember one woman who would have been, you know, like in her 80s, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, um, telling me that she was had been a teacher. And when she got married, she was told she had to quit. By the school or by her partner? No, by the school. Wow. Because once you were a married woman, you didn't work. Your husband supported you. Wow. Now, as it turned yeah. out, she pushed back and her husband was on her side. So the two of them pushed back and she kept on working. Okay. But it was just like all those things that you just like, holy crikey. Yeah, it is. So, and it, I was actually just talking about this with someone just yesterday at Generationally with the career with women. It, it seems like in a single generation, it went from you, you, you can be a nurse or a teacher or a secretary to you can do whatever you want to do. And I, I am so grateful for that. But it it, it was a... And you, like you said, there's always outliers, of course, but you know, uh, that was a huge change in like a 25 or 30 year period, like absolutely massive change. I absolutely grew up always believing and being told directly and indirectly that I could choose whatever I wanted to do in my career, that I was capable of it and that there was no reason um, that I couldn't do anything um, versus yeah, my mom's generation, your generation did not get those messages. Um, I've heard loud and clear from, from people of that generation that they were given a lot, very narrow, very narrow of what it was acceptable from a career perspective. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I think about, I think you and I probably would get along really well yeah. <laughs> because I was a bit of that wild child where, yes, I got the university education because that was the expectation. I was their last chance. I was a baby child. I was their last yeah. chance for someone getting a university education. And yet I still then just up sticks and took off. And I've done a few things that, you know, my parents quit talking to me for a few months. Uh, you know, my father was so angry with me about things, about my life and my lifestyle. And I, I'm, I wasn't even that wild. <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> Yeah. And I mean, I guess it hit home for me where I just I, I had to laugh when after I was married, I remember phoning my mother and saying, oh, surprise, I'm pregnant. And she was not very excited about that. Oh, fact. yeah. And so I sort of cut the conversation short because it was obviously going to go nowhere. Yeah. Uh, hung up. And about half an hour later, I got a phone call and she was all excited. And it turned out that my aunt was visiting from another country and my mother had not noticed the passage of time. So she just thought that it had been a shotgun wedding, even though it had been in the oh, plans that's really for, funny. for a year. <laughs> <laughs> but my aunt said, what are you talking about? You know, they've been married for, you know, like how yeah. long, six, eight weeks, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, so I always say, you know, I got the pregnant you know, what, what was it 10 minutes after I got married yeah but that's interesting too like that's another rule of like were oh, yeah. you allowed to when are you allowed to have children not have children what, what should you be what should oh, be your, your family be ashamed about or not yeah, ashamed yeah, about yeah. you know and, and then even generation although no I shouldn't say that I don't think it is generational but oh you know so so Heather when when are you going to give me a grandchild yeah that so, well, stuff yeah. You know, and I just I chose mean, your name because you're sitting there obviously yes. opposite me. <laughs> I will say because I'm not in a partner, because I'm not married, I'm not in a partnership. I don't get those questions directly, but I have friends who do, who are in, um, who, you know, when, as soon as they got married, they were started, you know, 
pa- their parents or other people around them were assuming they were going to have kids. When are you going to give me a grandchild? You know, you don't want to get too old. You want to make sure you have those kids. Da, da, da. And some were going to have kids. Some were not going to have kids. Some weren't sure. There was a whole wide variety. And then, you know, multiple people have fertility issues, which is a whole other situation of like, I want to, and I can't. So can you just please lay off, <laughs> you know, like a <laughs> yeah. whole other emotional thing. Um, but I will say I have been assumed. I remember going to an event once where I was, I sat down at a table with someone. I didn't know her. She didn't know me. And the first question out of her mouth was, how many kids do you have? And I was like, first of all, is that the most interesting thing about me? No, (laughs) but also that's a huge assumption. Like you made a lot of assumptions. It wasn't even a yes or no. It was a how, how many. And so, you know, there have been times I think, you know, especially I don't get this as much in Colorado. I got it way more in Minnesota of just assuming you know, well, of course, like every woman in her mid to late thirties has kids. Like, of course, even though factually that is not the case at all, it is a generalized expectation. I think in that culture that that's, that that's what, what you do. (laughs) And so you just assume someone that age does. So even, even I have experienced that, um, in more indirect ways, I would say. And, and, but I have had friends my age who are in, they get it more once they get married, uh, regardless of what they want or desire. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, pretty crazy. Yes. I'm going to ask you about your books in a second. Yeah. But is there anything we haven't talked about that you want women to think about? Um, and, and remembering that many of our listeners are mid-age women. Yeah. I think, you know, the the thing is is just to start, if, if this is resonating with you, just start noticing what are the rules that you've been handed in your life. And sometimes those are really direct, like from a parent or a teacher or a partner or something. And sometimes I mean, most of mine were very generalized cultural messages that I, I got by osmosis of just the water I was swimming in, not by any one specific person, but just to start to notice, start to notice what rules you are handed and know that you have a choice, that it does not matter what age you are. You can, you can start to let go of those rules and, and, and experiment and see what really feels true for you. But noticing is, is the first step of just, you know, you, you've probably had some going through your, if you've made it to this point in the podcast, you've probably had some going through your head. And, and if not just, I still notice new rules and I'm like, oh, wait, yes, I was handed that rule sometimes related to gender, sometimes having, you know, how we show up in conflict about money, about, I mean, just a million different things. We are handed shoulds and supposed tos and rules about everything and starting to notice those and with total openness and curiosity and self-compassion and, you know, suspending as much judgment as you possibly can notice and then see where that noticing leads. See if there's something you want to try and choose to let go of or change a rule for yourself. Um, sometimes I found it's helpful to to pick an actual new rule. I didn't do that as much with, I did that a little bit with the second breakthrough, but with the first one around overachieving, I consciously chose a new rule of I am worthy for who I am, not what I do. And so I could ground myself back into that when, when needed. And I, I literally said it to myself every day for months. Um, so you can choose a new rule that feels more true to you. So those are, I think those are the beginning steps to, to change is to notice and then and then start to uh, decide what you want, where you want to change and what you want to let go and some new rules you want to create for yourself. Letting go part is always so much fun. Yes, <laughs> it's freedom. It's not always easy, but it is freeing. It is absolutely shitting all freeing. over yourself. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yes, and there's so much on, yeah, there's just so much on the other side of that. It's, it's yeah, freeing is just the best way I can describe it. Okay, you've, you've written two books. You've said, uh, told us a little bit about them. What else? Yeah. So, I mean, there. if you're only going to read one, I'd read the second one because I think it encompasses both. Uh, I said that at a book launch and one of my friends who'd read both jumped right in. She's like, I agree. I agree with that <laughs> statement. So, um, and actually I had someone just tell me recently, they liked the second one better because they thought it was even more authentic, uh, more, more vulnerable, more real. I think the first one was pretty authentic too, but the first one is really specifically around overachieving and perfectionism. It hints at some other things in life. And certainly there's practices, but um, it really is, is aimed at people who would identify as good student, overachiever, perfectionist, all of that kind of stuff versus grounded wildness is all of those rules. And I'm really clear, particularly in grounded wildness, that I am not telling you what rules you should let go. I'm not telling you what grounded wildness means to you. I'm not telling you what your life should look like. None of that. Like this is, this is all 
it's all up to you. And, and that's really what grounded wildness is, is when you have broken those rules that have broken you and then you get to step into that newfound freedom where you're not, you're not feeling like you have to prove or please or perfect or rebel against anything. Like you just get to be you regardless of how it looks on the outside. It's, it's, you're tapping into your own feelings on the inside of what you know is true to you and grounded wildness will take you there. And it's part memoir, part self-help. So yes, it guides through my story and some of which I've shared today. And then there's obviously additional things in the book too, but then the whole second half is called getting grounded and wild. And it's all practices about both moving through some of those realizations and openings and breaks, and also staying in your version of grounded wildness. So talk about creating space to hear yourself think and know what's even true to you, feeling your feelings, following aliveness, trusting your own knowing, finding your grounded wildness community. Um, so it's very, yeah, practice oriented towards figuring out what what's going to work for you and what do you take away and different people there's definitely a running theme from the feedback i've gotten around kind of your own inner compass and authenticity and letting go of the shoulds and supposed tos and you know the takeaways the specific takeaways are different for different people um i had a woman just yesterday email me and said you know the following aliveness really hit home for her and she's like i'm going to dance more i'm going to go to even more live music i'm going to spend more time in nature and i'm going to keep eating chocolate <laughs> And I love that. She's like, that's what, that's aliveness for me. And that's the biggest thing I'm taking away from the book. And it's like, great. Everyone is going to read it at their own space and time. And, and yeah, so grounded wildness, it's um, if you are in the U S you can get signed hardcover copies on my website, which is heatherwellplay.com. And then it's back backslash shop. I have a journal out there as well. Um, but you can also get the outside the U S you can get the ebook, audiobook, and actually the journal is on Amazon um, as well, but you can't get the hardcover yet. At some point I will have the paperback out on Amazon, um, but it's not out there quite yet, but you can get, yeah, both the books, both the books, audiobook, ebook and hardcover are out there for anyone who wants one. <laughs> okay. We can just finish now. Cause you've answered all my questions. Okay. No, I'm just, I'm just joking. Um, okay. Why a journal? You know, I didn't do one for the first book and I, I knew immediately I wanted one for this book. Um, it's not a guidebook, so it doesn't ask questions. It, the cover looks very similar. So the kind of a, it says grounded wildness, the journal on it has a quote when you open it on the front page and the back page. And then there are quotes from the book throughout, uh, throughout the journal about every maybe fifth or sixth page is a quote from the book. And I mean, I, I think part of it's because I love to journal. I have been an avid journaler, you know, not a daily one. I'm not, you know, not someone who's like, oh, I, every morning I wake up and journal for 15 minutes. That's not me, but I write and journal regularly and have done so since I was like in fourth grade. I mean, a really, really long time. So I know that for me and for a lot of other people processing through journaling is so helpful. I mean, I think about like these, these realizations, these breaks and breakthroughs that I had journaling was a key component to that. And, and because I kept all my journals, I mean, there's quotes from my journals in the book, but there's also places where I was able to capture very real emotion because I could read it back through in my journal and see that. Um, but also there's a lot in grounded wildness. There's a lot to explore. So even though it's not a workbook, the journal's not a workbook with prompts, it is a place to explore for yourself what what's coming up for you as you read it. You know, I've had multiple people tell me that they read the, they read the entire book in like one or two days, but then they're going to go back and do the exercises. They're going to go back and do the reflections. And the journal is a great a great place to do that. So you can use the journal however you want as an accompaniment to the book, or just as a journal to write down whatever you want. But I I knew right from the get go um, that I really wanted a journal to go along with the book. I was really interested to see that you also have book club guides. I do. Yeah, they're on my website. Um, so if you have that same link, heatherwelpley.com backslash shop for both books, I have a um, book club guide with 15 or 20 questions in it that anyone, anyone can use. Um, and yeah, and I'm also exploring right now. I can't quite announce it yet, but I'm likely going to be doing an online book club through a platform that already exists out there. So I love, I think this is absolutely a book to discuss with other people and to hear, you know, what came up for you when you read this book? What rules, what rules are you noticing that you're following? I mean, I do that in my speaking engagements as well. So when I speak at a, a conference or a company, whether it's virtual or in person, and I've done a lot because of the pandemic, done a lot of virtual work. And so I will have people type into the chat, 
what rules were you handed? And then they get to see all of these rules that everyone was handed, some of which are very similar, some of which are different. So it's a great, it's a really great book, I think, to discuss. And then the book club guide can give you some structure to that as well, whether you're just discussing with one other person or with, you know, a book club of, of 12 people. Yeah, they're 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 out there and they're free. You can just literally click on the link. It, it says something like book club guide. <laughs> uh, it's something very obvious right underneath. It's under the same as like, read an excerpt from the book, buy the book, book club guide. They're all right there together. So it's a, a very obvious place that you can get that on my website. And speaking of free, uh, you have a guide to saying no at work. Yes. Yeah. So anyone who would like that, we'll put the, probably put the link in the show notes, hopefully. And then honestly, if you land on my website about 30 seconds later, it'll pop up as well. So you can just go to (laughs) heatherwelfley.com and you'll see, you'll see that show up too. It is, it is more work related, but having said that, I've had people tell me that a lot of the strategies in there, they can use for, for anything um, that's out there. And then you'll get on my email list and my email list, I send out stories, reminders, resources. Uh, I might be offering some new programs in 2024. So it's a wide variety. I usually send the email out about once a week. We call it the Grounded Wildness Weekly to remind you of your own grounded wildness and and uh, tools for some of the barriers that get in the way of that too, which right. are very real as well. In case you're wondering, I have another monitor over here because you're yeah. also on social, right? Yes. LinkedIn is my best social media platform. Um, yeah. Which is probably not what you hear from most guests, but <laughs> because a lot of my, uh, a lot of people I work with work inside companies, uh, uh, Heather Wopley, I'm on LinkedIn. You can do Instagram as well. I will say I am hit or miss on Instagram. Sometimes I'll use it every day for two or three months and then I won't look at it for two or three months. So you just never know what you're getting uh, with both of those. But those are the two places you can find me. And just generally, I have a very weird last name. I might be the only Heather Welpley in the world. So the good news about that is if you Google anything even remotely similar to my name, you can find me no problem, no matter no matter where I am. Um, and I love to get messages and hear what's resonating with you, whether it's from this podcast or the book as a whole. There's a contact form on my website too, if you want to send a message. I, I love to hear from people. Excellent. Before we close, can I ask you a personal question? Yeah. I'm going to give you three references. You okay. Expl- you explain. Oh, now I'm curious. <laughs> Be- Beach Cliff Trail, Green Mountain, Ladders. Uh, well, Green Mountain is, a, I live in Colorado and Green Mountain is a, a mountain in Boulder. <laughs> mm-hmm. Am I supposed to make, be drawing a connection between these, yeah, oh, these absolutely. three things? Yeah, I did. Um, and I only scrolled your pictures. Beach Cliff Trail? Is that a trail I've hiked? I have no idea. <laughs> Is that the I have one no in Maine? Idea. Is that the one in Maine? There's Could one be. In Maine. Could be. But okay, the first the first <laughs> picture, the first picture I found was you up this cliff on a ladder, a cliff ladder, and the oh. camera's looking down. Oh, okay. Was it in May? I've done that a couple of times. So. I know. That's why I'm saying, oh my God. Um, I, yeah, I do not have a fear of heights, but having said that, usually those ladders are pretty short. They probably look, it probably looks scarier in the picture than it actually is. I'm, I'm, I am not a massive risk, risk taker. I don't think so. Um, I don't hang on the side of cliffs. I, I don't do those things. Um, but yeah, you Maine, hang on I the ladder on the side of a cliff. Yeah. I will hang on a ladder, but usually those ladders are not, like I said, they're really not that long, but yeah, I've done those in uh, I can think of a couple of trails. Maine for sure had one on the bee. I think it was the beehive trail or bee, something like that. Um, and yeah, I've done some other, including, I will say my mom and I, my mom, who was probably 70 at the time, both climbed up a ladder in New Mexico <laughs> on a hiking trail as well. So I come by it, honestly. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. You're a better woman than I am. I'm not going to say that right up front. Uh, it took me years to just climb a step ladder, you know what I mean? We all have our things. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So your website link is in the show notes. You also have a page on our website and all the links are always on there. Wonderful. Yeah. Listeners, if you have thoughts on today's show, please talk to us. Leave comments where you're listening. Or if you're listening at the Boomer Woman's podcast at boomwithabang.com, scroll to the bottom of the page and talk to us there. Or what question did I not ask Heather? Ask it in the comments and you'll get an answer. Ooh, I would uh, love to see what comes up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, as usual, leave stars and reviews where you can. They help us grow. And share this episode. 
even today, girls and women are being guided or pushed into following someone else's rules or societies. We need to stop that. And we need to encourage the women around us to break free from the rules. And if you're the one still following the rules, well, just listen to this episode again. <laughs> Heather Welpley, thank you for being my guest today and being so open about your own life and so encouraging about finding our grounded wildness. Thank you. It has been an absolute joy and pleasure talking with you today. Thanks so much for having me. No, thank you. Have a great rest of week. Thanks, you too.